Well, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. This is Mark Turner here. And um, we're reviewing number 48 of the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Survival. Number 48 was, was written by Mr. James Monk. It was shown in the last paper, number 47, that the political uh, political APOTHPGM. I thought I said that different. That's that word. Political Forget it. Political. In the last paper, that the political left, their examined does not require that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments should be wholly unconnected with each other. With each other. I, James Madison, shall undertake in the next place to show that unless these departments be so far connected and blended as to give to each a congressional a constitutional control over the others, the degree of separation which the maximum requires as essential to a free government can never in practice be fully fully maintained. It is agreed on all sides that the powers properly belonging to one of the departments ought not to be directly or completely administered by either of the departments. It is equally evident that none of them ought to possess directly or indirectly an, an overruling influence over the others in the administration of the respective powers. It will not be denied that power is of an important nature and that it ought to be effectually restrained in passing the limits assigned to it. After discriminating, therefore, in theory, the several, several great classes of power, as they may in their nature be legislative, executive, or judicial, the next and most difficult task is to provide some practical security for each against the invasion of the others. What this security ought to be is the great problem. Will it be sufficient to mark with precision the boundaries of these departments in the Constitution of the government and to trust to these parchment barriers against an encroaching spirit of power? This is the security which appears to have been principally relied on by the compilers of most of the American constitutions. But experience assures me that the efficacy of the provision has been greatly overrated and that some more apt more adequate defense is indispensably necessary for the more feeble against the more powerful methods. The legislative department is everywhere extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its infectious process. The founders of our republics have so much merit for the wisdom which they have displayed that no fact can be less pleasing than that of pointing out the errors into which they have fallen. A respect for truth, however, obliges us to, to remark that they seem never, to, never for a moment to have turned their eyes from the dangers to liberty, from the overgrown and all grasping prerogative of an hereditary magistrate, supported and fortified and, by an hereditary branch of a legislative assembly. They seem never to have recollected the danger of domesticated usurpation which by assembling all power in the same hands must lead to the same tyranny as it threatened, as is threatened by executive usurpation. In a government where numerous <clears throat> and extensive derivatives are placed in the hands of a, of a hereditary monarch, the executive department is very much justly regarded as a source of danger and watched with all the jealousy which a zeal for liberty ought to inspire. In a democracy where a multitude of people exercise and person their legislative functions and are continually exposed by their incapacity for regular deliberation and concerted measures to the ambitious injuries of the executive magistrates, tyranny may well be apprehended on some favorable emergency to start up in the same place. But in the representative republic where the executive magistracy 
is carefully limited both in the extent any duration of its power and whether legislative power is exercised by an assembly, which is inspired by a supposed influence over the people with an inseparable confidence in its own strength, which is sufficiently numerous to feel all the passions which actually are multitude, yet not so numerous as to be incapable of pursuing the objects of its passions by means which reason describes. It is against the enterprising ambition of this department that the people ought to indulge all their jealousy and exhaust all their anger. The legislative department derives its superiority in our government from, the, uh, from other circumstances. Its constitutional powers being at once more extensive and less susceptible of precise limits, it can, with the greater facility, mass on the complicated and indirect measures the encroaching encroachment which it makes on a coordinate, on a coordinate department. It is not unfrequently a question of real nicety in legislative bodies whether the operation of a particular measure will or will not extend beyond the legislative field. On the other side, the executive power being restrained within the narrower compass and being more simple in its na nature, and the judiciary being described by landmarks still as uncertain. Objects of usurpation by either of these departments would either betray and defeat themselves. Nowhere is this all as the legislative department alone has access to the pockets of the people and has in some constitutions full discretion and in all of the prevailing influence over the pecuniary rewards of those who fill the other departments of dependence is thus created in the law. Which gives still greater facility to the approaches of it. One, I have appealed to our own experience for the truth of what I advance on this subject. Were it necessary to verify this experience, then might be multiplied without end. Without end. I might find a witness in every citizen who has shared in or being attended to the course of public administration. I might collect vouchers and vouchers in, in, in abundance in the records and archives of every state in the union. But as a more concise and at the same time equally satisfactory evidence, I will I will refer to the example of two states tested by two unexceptionable, unacceptable authorities. The first example is that of Virginia. A state which, as we have seen, has expressly, de expressly declared in its constitution that the three great departments ought not to be in it. The authority in support of it is Mr. Jefferson, Thomas who, besides his other advantages and remarking the operation of the government, was himself the chief magistrate of it. In order to convey fully the ideas with which his experience had impressed him on, on the subject, it will be necessary to quote a passage of some length from his very interesting notes of the on the state of the page, page 185. Quote, all the powers of government, the legislative, executive, and judiciary, result to the result to the legislative body. The, cons the concentrating these in the same hands is precisely the definition of despot despotic government. It will be no it will be no alleviation that these powers will be exercised by a plurality of hands and not by a single one. 173 districts would surely be as a person as one. Let those who doubt it turn their eyes on the public advantages. As little will it avail as that as that they are chosen by itself. And the electric despotism is not the government in fact, but one which not only which should not only be found in a free, free principle, but on which, in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced among several bodies of magistracy as that no one could transcend the legal limits without being effectually checked and restrained. For this reason, that convention would pass the ordinance of the latest foundation on this basis, 
that the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments should be separate and distinct so that no person should exercise the powers of more than one other at the same time. But no barrier was provided between these separate powers. The judiciary and the executive members were less dependent on the legislature for their subsistence in office and some of them for their subsistence that left dependent on the legislative position in office. Okay, I'm sorry. The judiciary and the executive members were left dependent on the legislative for their subsistence in office and some of them for their continuance in it. If therefore the legislative assumes executive and judiciary powers, no opposition is likely to be made, nor if made can be effective. Because in that case, they may put their proceedings into the form of acts of assembly, which will render them obligatory on the other branches. They have accordingly, in many instances, decided rights which should, which should have been left left to judiciary controversy and the direction of the executive during the whole time of the session is becoming a future in the middle. Okay. The other state, this is James Madison speaking, the other state which I shall have for an example is Pennsylvania. And the other authority, the council censor which assembled in the year 1783 and part of the duty of this body, as marked out by the Constitution, was to inquire whether the Constitution had been preserved in fire in the department, and whether the legislative and executive branches of government had performed their duty as guardians of the as or as or assumed to be the or exercised other other or greater powers than they are entitled to by the Constitution. In the execution of this trust, the Council will necessarily lay to a companion of both the legislative and the executive proceedings with the constitutional powers of these departments. And from the facts enumerated, we can prove in most of which both sides and the Council subscribe or subscribe. It appears that the Constitution has been flagrantly violated by the legislature in the variety of instances. A great number of laws have, have, have been passed, violating without any apparent necessity for rule, requiring that all bills of a public nature shall be previously tendered to the consideration of the people, although this is one of the precautions chiefly relied on by the Constitution against improper acts of legislature. The constitution, constitution of trial by jury has been, has been violated and powers soon which have not been delegated by the Constitution. The executive powers have been usurped. The salaries of the judges, which the Constitution especially requires to be fixed, had been occasionally there. In cases belonging to the Judiciary Department, frequently drawn within legislative cognizance and determination. Those who wish to see the several particulars following under each of these things may consult the journals of the council which are in session. Council which is in session. Some of them it will be found may be imputable to peculiar circumstances connected with the war, but the greater part of them may be considered as a as the spontaneous seat of an ill constituted government. It appears also that the executive department and not the innocent or frequent breaches of the Constitution. There are three observations, however, that ought to be made on this day. First, a great proportion of the instances were either immediately produced by the unnecessary situation or recommended by Congress or the commander in chief, the president. Second, in most of the other instances they performed, either they were duly declared or the known sentiment of the legislative department. And third, the executive department of Pennsylvania is distinguished from that of the other states by the number of members in In this respect, 
it has as much affinity to the legislative assembly as in the in executive council. And be not one exempt in the list the strength of an individual responsibility for the acts of the body and deriving public confidence in mutual examples of joint influence on operators. On operating measures would, of course, be more freely hazarded than where the executive department was administered by a single hand or by few. The conclusion which I am warranted in drawing from these observations is that, is that a mere demarcation and parchment of the constitutional limits of the charter departments is not a sufficient guard against those encroachments which lead to a tyrannical concentration of all the powers of government in the center. That's 48. That's quite short. I may read 49 and 50 later tonight for uh, extra special federalist side. But for now, that was number 48 by Mr. James Madison. And I will uh, leave you guys with that. Very interesting um, writing there by James Madison, the fourth president of the United States. And we are getting close to, we're getting close to 50, but I don't think in the Actually, okay. okay, 85. Okay, so 85. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. More than half. More than half. Half of eight four is twenty one. So we're actually so uh I will spend as much time as possible on this, but again, uh we're we're more than halfway through the federal papers. So I hope you're enjoying these. Have a great day and a great week. Bye.